Hi everybody, uh, my name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today and I've gathered together a team of uh, space aficionados to talk about interesting events in this, uh, this week in space. Uh, this is a total experiment. We're all, uh, although we're going to try and be as professional and uh, knowledgeable as we can, I guarantee nothing. Maybe silliness. So. Um, now, a few sort of housekeeping before we kind of get rolling with this. Um, I'm fairly certain that after I sort of click off my window, you won't see a bigger version of me for the rest of this whole thing. So, I, um, and that's just a str strange gimmick on the way that Hangouts work. Uh, there's going to be a video window where you're watching this live broadcast, and then below that, there should be um, a list of links um, or a list of comments that are going to be happening underneath. And so if anyone wants to kind of jump in and ask questions or comment on the show or, or anything, we'll be able to see that and we'll be able to respond to it and answer your questions and, and so on. Um, and Phil Plate has a very loud keyboard. <laughs> well, I'm trying to advertise this. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. So I'll, I, I'll mute while I type. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think we're all going to, you know, we do definitely need to take a second just to, now that we have the, we've started up the show, we need to, uh, we're that gives us a link that we can then tell everybody about and so that they can join us on, the, on this recording. So uh, you might see it, it's going to be sort of silent for a little while while we all sort of copy-paste links. And, and put Yay. Them on. Yeah. And hey, definitely Nicole. try and remember Hi. everyone's. Twitter handles. <laughs> the, um, so, so for everyone who's participating, the, the, the kind of canonical link, the place where everyone wants to view it, is the one that should have popped up in my stream. So you don't want to you don't want to share the link of the hangout. You want to share the link of the live broadcast. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's only a limit of eight people. I think we've already filled it. So, and so I think we'll we'll do that quickly, and then I will sort of introduce everybody. Uh, there we go. I see some. Uh, I see some comments. So, all right. Um, so, and if anyone wants to know, if you if you uh, if you copy paste the the date, the timestamp that's on the top of the of the thread, that's a permanent link. Like, that's a permanent link to the actual event. So. That's the thing that you can tweet or what have you. John, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, Voyageriza, V O I J A. -R -I -S -A. You are muted, John. I see your lips moving. I shouldn't be muted. No, I hear him just fine. Yeah, I hear him fine. Let me eat the mic a little bit more. Okay. It's Voyageriza, V O I J A R I S A. All right. Okay. So while we're doing that, I will. Uh, the, the problem with this system, you know, we're still learning all the bugs and the quirks, is, uh, is that when we, we don't know where the video is going to be until we actually start the video up. And so we have no way to know where to link to, to people until we actually get it started. That would be kind of helpful. Anyway, if anyone from Google is listening. Um, okay, well, I think, I think I will start sort of introducing people, and I will sort of switch off my video now so that we can sort of see everybody. All right, so the first person uh, over on, I guess I'm not sure if you're seeing the same that I'm seeing <laughs> on my window, but the, uh, the first person, I'm going to try and highlight, that's Alan Boyle, who is, a, Hi guys. Uh, is from uh, Cosmic Log, MSNBC's Cosmic Log. Hello. We've, Hello. Got, we've got Ian O'Neill, who's going to wave. There we go. Good morning. Um, from Discovery.com's space. Is that the way to describe it? Uh, Discovery News space. Discovery News Space. Yeah. Uh, we've got John Boise, who is a contributor to Universe Today, um, and the angry astronomer, although he's not so angry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Atkinson, who is the senior editor at Universe Today. Um, Nicole Gugliucci. Garvin <laughs> and Argan. How did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Nicole Gallucci. 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 All right. Yes. Um, Nicole Nicole Gallucci, who is the noisy astronomer, and uh, and is actually on. You're in the middle of like a 
science meeting right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm on at a conference location. in Boulder uh, right now. So I just snuck out of uh, the second half of the uh, one of the plenary talks. <laughs> Um, and then, you, of course, most people probably know Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy Cast. That's not Pamela. That's Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's very easy to confuse the two I, of us. I know. <laughs> and, then, and then last but not least is uh, Dr. Phil Plate, the uh, bad astronomer who uh, blogs over at badastronomy.com. All right. So, so what we're going to do here is we're going to go through probably. Uh, Pamela, could you mute your microphone when you're not talking? Because yeah. I said you've got a big background noise coming through your mic. Yeah. Perfect. Um, but then don't forget to unmute it. <laughs> so, um, right. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take a sort of look at some of the big news stories that cracked in the space and astronomy news that that some or all of us have been reporting on this week and give you an you know an overview of 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 what we think and what it's about. And so if you don't sort of have the time to go through every news story all the time like we all do, then at least you can get our analysis and, and understanding of, of what it's all about. Uh, so the, we've got sort of a, a loose set of topics we wanted to cover. We wanted to talk about the uh, NASA, the GRAIL mission, which recently arrived at the moon. It's going to be mapping the moon. Uh, we've got the Phobos Grunt mission, which has unfortunately failed, but is possibly going to be returning to Earth spectacularly within the next few days. Uh, we've got the Kudrantid meteor shower, which just ended, but I uh, want to talk about meteor shower observing in general. Um, we've got... Uh, list here. Uh, it's 2012, which is kind of the big year for debunking people who are... 2012 doomsaying, and so we wanted to sort of talk a bit about what we're going to be working on this year to try and keep the conspiracy nonsense down. And then if we have time, we've got a bit of a silly story that uh, Obama apparently teleported to Mars. So, so, so first, let's let's talk about let's get back to some actual science, and we'll talk about the 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 NASA's Grail mission, which arrived at the moon and in the last week or so. And I think Nancy, I think, has been doing a lot of the reporting on that. So Nancy, can you sort of fill people in on what the GRAIL mission is? Nope, oh, she's muted. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, there. sorry. Um, GRAIL actually stands for Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory. And uh, what it is is two different space spacecraft that are working in tandem with each other, communicating back and forth to each other to kind of map the entire interior of the moon. And it kind of works a lot like uh, the GRACE mission that is uh, orbiting Earth, uh, where there's two spacecraft. And the exciting thing um, over the holiday weekend was that the two spacecraft successfully uh, were inserted into lunar orbit. Um, I think uh, GRAIL A went in to orbit on New Year's Eve, and GRAIL B went into orbit on New Year's Day. So that was pretty exciting. and. Um, they're going to be working on uh, getting into the, their correct orbits for the next couple of months and won't actually begin their observations until March. Uh, but basically um, what happens is that the two spacecraft, they transmit radio signals to each other and um, that kind of defines the, dis the distance between them. And as they fly over the different uh, like mountains on the moon or craters or actually there's also uh, kind of hidden masses that we don't know much about underneath the lunar surface called mass cons and uh, as they fly over those uh, and transmit signals to each other they should be able to map the uh, uh, the moon's gravitational field and uh, the scientists are also hoping to be able to find out if the moon does the moon does have have a core and uh, also some other uh, information that they're trying to just find out more about our nearest neighbor in space. So anyone can feel free to jump in and uh, and participate on the conversation. I can see Phil jumping in his seat. <laughs> no, I'm just getting more comfortable, but, oh, but okay. sure. I, I love the way this stuff works. Um, you can land on the surface of the moon and explore it, and we've done that six times. With, with human beings and uh, several times with some landers and things like that. But that really only tells you about what's going on on the surface or maybe if there have been volcanoes or lava flows that have erupted from down below. It tells you a little bit about what's going on just beneath the surface. But w this is going to map stuff that's way down deep. 
and we're not going to see it. We don't have to drill down. It's simply because that stuff exists. And the way that this is being done, I think, is really phenomenal. Because you have these two spacecraft, which are going around the moon, uh, they're going to be uh, only 50 kilometers above the surface of the moon, very, very close, and separated by only 200 kilometers. So it's really, they're very close together. And they're going to communicate to each other using radio, basically, sending pulses to each other. And by knowing the speed of light, uh, you can calculate the distance between them. And it, it's, it's not exactly the way radar guns work with cops, but it's, it's just a way of ranging, of getting the distance. The thing is, because this is so accurate, the distance between these two spacecraft is going to be known to a distance of about a micron. Now that is a millionth of a meter. These guys are going to be 200,000 meters apart, but they're going to know their relative distance to about a millionth of a meter. Uh, and a micron is very roughly the diameter of a red blood cell. Okay, if you, if you want to you, you wanna get a handle on this, if you were to pluck a hair out of your head, if you, if you could, in fact, have hair to pluck out of your head and hold it up, that would be 100 microns. That's 100 times the accuracy of, of how well known these two guys are going to be apart. And the importance of this is that as, as they're going around the moon, if, if there's a slightly denser region of the moon ahead, it's going to pull on the forward satellite a little bit faster, a little bit harder than the one behind it, and they'll separate and they'll be able to measure that change. And so as these, as these two guys are moving together and apart, together and apart, they'll be able to map out the density of the moon underneath. And that's how they're going to figure out what's going on underneath the surface. It's, it's Star Trek technology. It's very cool. It, it's well, very... Go ahead, Emma. It, it's very cool. And in a certain way, it's very simplistic. It, it's just as simple as watching the spacecraft roll in and out the gravitational divots. We see the universe as a big empty nothing. But when objects respond to gravity, they roll along surfaces of higher gravitational pull and lower gravitational pull. And these spacecraft are literally accelerating into the higher, higher gravity regions and slowing down as they come back out. And we get to measure them moving on a surface we can't see that only exists in mathematical space. Didn't they do sort of similar process for here on Earth to sort of map out the Earth's was it geode? This has been done with a number of missions. As Nancy mentioned, um, it, it's been done most recently with the GRACE mission. And then there's the GOES mission, too, that's going on right now from yeah. ESA. That's a single satellite, but it's the same idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when, when will we start to sort of see this, the science of this? I mean, are there any big discoveries that could come out of this? Solid, well, I guess, solid core, liquid core? It, it's an ongoing mission, so we, we have to wait for it to circle and circle and circle and circle, and as it goes, map out what's going on underneath it. Um, one orbit isn't enough, a couple dozen orbits isn't enough, but they have 90 days of orbits planned. That's both good and sad, though. This, this mission actually will likely come to an end because the Earth gets in the way of the sun. This is a solar-powered pair of spacecrafts, and there's concern that during the next solar, not solar eclipse, during the next lunar eclipse, our shadow will prevent the solar panels from getting all the energy they need, bringing an end to this mission. Now, it's hoped that, well, maybe they're wrong. Maybe these spacecraft are able to survive that period of darkness, in which case we'll get a continuing mission out of it. One of the coolest things about this mission is the uh, MoonCam project that Sally Ride has helped to organize, uh, where middle school students will have the ability to select targets on the moon for pictures and video to be taken. And so that may be one of the first fruits of the mission, actually, to, to see that cool imagery. Wow. And then, of course, you have the issue of finding the monolith that's buried on the moon thanks to its gravitational effect. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Wow, place your bets. Yeah, that was one of the cool things that uh, we wrote about on Discovery News was that um, Grail could ultimately discover the remnants of uh, the moon's twin. So there could be a second uh, satellite that at some point in the history of the Earth-Moon system, a solid body did evolve, and then it crashed very slowly into, into the lunar surface. So we may actually see the dead body of a, of a, like a lunar sibling. And I thought that was, that was really, really cool. Oh, oh, so you would be able to, to detect sort of a different density because the object had some kind of different density when it came together. Yeah. 
I mean, because as Phil said, you, these uh, these spacecraft can detect um, densities uh, of really, really, really deep down inside the inside the lunar core, but it's also going to detect these densities towards the surface. And it is believed that perhaps there was this cosmic collision sometime in the past, and you're going to be able to pick up this increase in density, which is actually the remnant of a lunar sibling. So, and that would really explain cool. the different. Uh, terrain that people see on the far side of the moon yeah. as opposed to the near side. The, the far side is more mountainous and they think that's because of this second moon effect which some people call the big splat. <laughs> Alright, well we've already got you uh, going there, Alan, so why don't we switch topics and we'll go to the Phobos Grunt mission which sadly failed and is possibly returning home uh, within right. the next couple of weeks, right? So, can, so what, right, was, what, was, right. what, was, what was the goal uh, we, of Phobos Grunt? We've heard a lot about GRAIL over the past few days, and we're going to be hearing a lot about Phobos Grunt over the next few days. Uh, Phobos Grunt was supposed to go to uh, the biggest moon, the bigger moon of Mars, Phobos, and return with some soil. Uh, and the Russian word for soil is Grunt, and so that's why they call it Phobos Grunt. Phobos soil, but it got stuck in Earth orbit, uh, that there may have been some sort of interference because of some of the fuel tanks. People are speculating about how it got stuck, but whatever the cause was, uh, it did not get out of Earth orbit, and that caused a whole bunch of problems. They've been having trouble communicating with the satellite, and now its orbit is decaying, and uh, the latest projection is that it's going to be somewhere around January 15th that it makes re-entry, uh, plus or minus two days. That's one of the estimates that, that I've heard. And uh, the thinking is that there would be, oh, something like uh, 400 pounds worth of debris that, that actually survives uh, re-entry and hits the Earth, including perhaps the uh, sample return capsule that was supposed to bring this stuff back from Phobos. And uh, the, the big concerns are that uh, a lot of the mass of the satellite is made up in toxic fuel, something like 11 uh, metric tons, uh, is, consists of this fuel, and will some of this frozen fuel survive re-entry and hit the Earth? I think the thinking is right now that it won't, that it'll just be a nice big blow-up when it goes through atmospheric re-entry. And there are also a few micrograms of radioactive cobalt on board, but Again, the Russians say that that's, that's not going to be a concern. But as we've seen with a couple of these other missions, uh, the upper atmosphere research satellite that crashed into uh, the ocean in September, and then the Rosat satellite, a German space telescope that uh, similarly crashed into the sea uh, in October, uh, a lot of people get nervous when you hear that some uncontrolled satellite is going to be plunging through the atmosphere and bringing fiery death. And I, I think Phil has written about this sort of scenario uh, every once in a while, and especially in his book, Death from the Skies. But uh, when you look at the chances of uh, the, this thing doing any damage, they're literally astronomical in the one out of trillions that any one particular person would be hit. Nevertheless, you're going to hear a lot more about this in the next few days, about uh, death from the skies, and so get ready for that. Have you got your next version of the book ready, Phil? Absolutely. Uh, no problem at all. Uh, yeah, Alan's right. Uh, when you think about these things coming in, 70% or so of the Earth's surface is covered with ocean. So overwhelmingly, uh, right away, uh, that's, that's where it's going to happen, is probably over the ocean. And the Pacific Ocean is, is the vast majority of that. And sure enough, uh, UARS and ROSAT came in over basically over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and even of the 20 to 30 percent of the Earth covered with land, only a little bit of that is populated, and only a little bit of that is densely populated. And that's why the odds of somebody getting hit by something are so small. But the problem here is that this is an uncontrolled reentry. It's just a satellite orbiting the Earth. There's drag on it from the Earth's atmosphere, very, very, very low density, hundreds of miles up, but it's there. So it's slowing the satellite. Uh, it, it's robbing the satellite of energy, basically, and dropping its orbit. And at some point, the atmosphere will get thick enough as it drops that it will catastrophically burn up, fall apart, and drop down to the Earth. But you can't predict when that's going to be. You just It's too hard to do. The, there are too many variables involved. Uh, it, it's, it's almost like saying, how exactly is this egg going to be scrambled when I'm done scrambling it? You can't do that. You just know it's going to be scrambled. We know this thing is coming down. We don't know where. And bear in mind 
that orbital speeds are several kilometers, several miles per second. So for every second that you're off in predicting when it's going to be, that footprint gets bigger and bigger. And if you're off by 10 minutes, you're talking thousands of miles, thousands of kilometers. So until right before this thing comes down, we won't know. And in fact, when it came to ROSAT, I think it was, we didn't know where it came down until after it actually burned up. That's that sounds scary, but again, the odds of it hitting anybody are pretty low, so I'm personally not terribly concerned. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Also, the cool thing um, that Phil touched on is the dynamics of the upper atmosphere. And, of course, um, oh, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Does it sound right, Ryan? Just uh, it's okay. massive feedback. Okay. Um, yeah, the best, as I noticed with the, uh, the previous re-entries of the UR satellite, the NASA um, atmospheric satellite, its re-entry was sped up by probably a couple of months, I think, it was a few months, because of an uptick in solar activity. Because, of course, on the surface of the sun, you get a lot of, um, a lot of flares kicking off, so you get a lot of uh, X-rays and radiation hitting the upper atmosphere, which causes the atmosphere to expand. So these up upper wispy um, outer regions of the upper atmosphere will be at higher altitudes than can be expected. And so when you get more solar activity, you get more drag on the satellites, and therefore there's, that's an added ambiguity in, to throw into the uh, orbital dynamics equations because you just don't know how that solar activity is going to influence the orbits of these satellites. And this is a very real problem for anything we put into space, anything we put into Earth orbit, is the drag caused by, um, by, by solar activity interacting with the upper atmosphere. So that's why I often get emails, you know, a most recent email was about Phobos Grunt, why are they keeping it secret where it's going to crash, obviously it's going to hit. LA. I mean, it's, it's got to hit LA. Um, if we're big enough, so it might be interesting, and I'll be, I'll be there at the crash site. Um, but there's no way of knowing, and that's that's not because people are being deliberately um, secretive about it. It's purely because we haven't got a clue. <laughs> yeah, there's just no way to know. Mm -hmm. Sorry, which is you know a lot of people don't like that, but yeah. I mean I think that's oh. that, you know oh. that's that's your science right there. Sometimes we just don't know. We Insufficient data. Yeah, it's fine. Um, uh, right. Uh, people think you could do a good James Earl Jones impression. Ian. This is on the. Uh, this is on the. Uh, James Earl Jones, really? Yeah. 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 You have a very deep voice. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So so now the next thing I wanted to talk about was the. You're all giggling when I say about, aren't you? Um, uh, yes. <laughs> the next thing I wanted to talk about was the uh, was the quadranted meteor shower, which uh, which peaked just a couple of days ago. But just sort of use this as a <laughs> as a way to just start, talk about these kinds of meteor showers in in general, and and sort of give people some advance notice on what's gonna what's gonna come next. Now, obviously, since this is sort of the first time we've done this, we didn't have a t chance to talk about it last week, but we would have told you for sure. So, so Pamela, you are a uh, resident uh, astronomer. What, uh, what can you tell us about <laughs> the quadrantid meteor shower and just meteor showers in general? Well, this one is a nicely positioned one. It's, uh, it's, it's point of, of meteors coming off is in the constellation booties, which is visible to most, most people in the northern hemisphere. You find the Big Dipper, you arc off of the Big Dipper um, to Arcturus, and Arcturus is the brightest star in booties. Look there, use your peripheral vision to look for anything in the sky that's moving away from booties, and there you have one of the quadrants. Right. The I mean, sorry, just one, one thing just to be clear about is that with meteor showers, you know, they have a night, a time that they peak, but they build up to that point, and yeah. they sort of build down away from that point. And so even though the peak happened yesterday night, yes. uh, you know, there's still going to be lots of them tonight, and so that was lots of what we're talking about. Sorry, go on, Pamela. Yes. <laughs> and, and the reason that you have this effect is because of what causes the meteor showers. So this particular one is associated with a small orbiting object that we think used to be a comet core. This is an object that goes by the name 2003 EH1, which is such an exciting name. And it's thought to be what's left of a comet that was visible to Chinese astronomers back in 1490. 
well, back in the day when this object orbited, it left behind a trail of it left behind a trail of debris, and periodically, like in January, the Earth passes through that trail of debris, and as that leftover stuff, the leftover grains of uh, frozen particulate dust, whatever it is, hits our atmosphere, it burns up and flashes across the sky. So whenever we see a meteor shower, what we're seeing is the Earth consuming leftover comet trails. And so if for now, if one of the things I think that was notable about this was that it had a very narrow peak. So why is it that this peak was so narrow compared to some of the other meteor showers which have peaks lasting two to three nights? Well, it, it all depends on how we're passing through the trail of the parent object. So as the comets go around and around time and time again, they're sometimes retracing their exact step, they're sometimes cutting a slightly new trail, all depending on the gravitational interactions they have with other objects. In some years, we'll pass through a section of multiple trails left behind by multiple passages that are extremely wide with thicker uh, bands that are denser in particulate from years that the comet was particularly active and had a big, beautiful, big, beautiful tail. Other years, the part that we pass through is a narrow swath from a single orbit. So it all depends on how our orbit is interacting with the past orbits of comets, which change from year to year. And so when is the next meteor shower going to be coming? What's the next one that people will be able to see? Well, the next one we have is April 21st, the next one that you really can get excited about, and this is the Lyrids. And what makes this one awesome is we don't have the moon to contend with. Uh, the bright light of a full moon is capable of drowning out the light from faint meteor streaks passing through the sky. No moon means you can see all of those faint little dust specks burning up in our atmosphere. So stay tuned for April. Yeah, if and if you're, we're still if doing this then, then we'll definitely give you some advance notice before then. Exactly. If you're somewhere... All right, well, that's, that's enough of the science. Now we... Is my mic working? Sorry. Oh. Uh-oh, Nicole, we lost you there. Can, can you guys hear me? It is, yeah. but you're kind of cutting in and out. Oh, uh, okay. Never yeah. Mind. We can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> oh, Go you can on. you hear me now? Okay. Gosh. Um... So if you're in a location where if, if it's cloudy during a meteor peak or if you're in a location where you can't, it's not dark and nighttime, um, you can use a simple radio if you want to observe the meteor shower in a different way. Um, yeah. Meteors, when they come through the atmosphere, they leave a trail of charged particles behind. And if you tune your radio just between stations where you can barely hear some faint distant station, every once in a while, it'll suddenly get a little bit bright, it'll suddenly get a little bit louder, um, and you'll hear it. And that's the... Um, the trail left by the meteor kind of points that radio, uh, distant radio station your way. So you can listen to the effects of a meteor shower, even if you're clouded out or too late to go outside. And Is that better for AM or FM? I think... It's reflected radio. Uh, yeah. So, so well, the thing to think about is what's happening is you have the radio signals from your station going up, mm -hmm. reflecting off of the ionized um, trail in the atmosphere and getting Doppler shifted by the motion in the reflection. Mm -hmm. So you can hear this all across the radio band. And there's recordings of this on the internet. And some of them sound like amazing whistles because the Doppler shifting changes. And who knows what's getting uh, Doppler shifted back to you. It could be some crazy hip hop song. It could Not that <laughs> hip hop is crazy, but some of them are crazy. It could be some crazy pop song. Um, and all of these different things produce slightly different trails as they get reflected back to us. And you can, li you can listen to them during the day. Exactly. Right. All right. Well, uh, like I said, that's, that's sort of enough of actual science. Now we're going to have to move to the <laughs> nonsense uh, portion of our, uh, of our broadcast. And, and, and obviously, we've got, you know, we're, we're into 2012, and this is sort of the final culmination of what has got to be three years of Ian O'Neill's life. And for those of you who don't know, <laughs> Ian O'Neill used to work for, uh, work for us at Universe Today until he was uh, snatched away by Discovery. Um, and, uh, and sort of, um, but, but one of the assignments, like we just gave it to him just as a, just an, you know, like why don't you take a crack at this was to, was we were getting a lot of queries about 2012 and people were kind of freaking out about 2012. And I said, Ian, why don't you just write an article about, you know, debunking 2012. 
and little did we realize that this would then turn into a, his career. So, so Ian, <laughs> you want to pick up the story? Yeah, well, as Fraser said, it was a strange conversation we had um, because I was, I was writing for Universe Today. This was uh, back in 2008. And Fraser just said, oh, this is strange. We're getting a lot of search queries for 2012 and Doomsday. What in the hell is it? And so I started doing some digging, and I said, yeah, there might be enough for a blog here. It's, it sounds like you know, a bunch of whack jobs seem to think that the world's coming to an end in 2012 because some ancient Mayan civilization, I didn't actually know much about the Mayans back then, um, but some ancient civilization in Central America are prophesizing doom. But they're not actually prophesizing it. You know, it's a lot of mistakes, whatever. I'll just do a quick blog. Um, as it turned out, that blog just went gangbusters. I mean, I, I'd never known anything like it. We were getting comments left, right, and center. In fact, at one point, Fraser, w w wasn't the comment system actually slowing down the whole site? The whole website, yeah. yeah, yeah so we, we cracked through a thousand comments, and I just I had to create a second article just to handle the comments that were coming yeah. into it. Yeah, I, I can only imagine your shock when you realize that I get paid commission on the number of hits. <laughs> so <laughs> Fraser was getting wheeled off to hospital <laughs> with a panic attack. But uh, you know, <laughs> but that, 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 that just seems like such a long time ago now because now it's, cause it was um, a mild, um, obscure, um, of, it was of interest and I like to debunk these things. I, I love conspiracy theories anyway, so I thought why not, we'll do this. And because of the popularity of the first article, I started looking at all the, uh, the purveyors of doom. So you know, Phil knows this very well from his, um, from his book, um, Death from the Skies. You've got um, these, these prophesized um, um, asteroids, you've got comets, you've got killer solar flares, you've got gamma ray bursts, you've got galactic alignments, all this. Most of it, the, 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 I think the biggest problem with this doomsday, this doomsday scenario is that every single cosmic scenario is being thrown at this one day. And it's all down to the Mayan um, long count calendar, and basically it runs out, or runs out, or goes into a new cycle um, at, on the 21st of December 2012. Now, there's no, there's nothing behind this apart from a bunch of myth and um, just the fact that this calendar, ancient calendar runs out. Now, the Mayans, they, they existed in the Central American region, so you've got Guatemala, uh, Southern Mexico, Honduras, and a couple other countries. And so they, they, that civilization was in that region, and they came up with an amazingly complex calendar. And it just so happens by a numerical coincidence that it lines up with our calendar. Bear in mind, there were two completely independent calendars, so there's a little bit of ambiguity as to how you interpret their dates into our dates. But generally, archaeologists um, agree that the 21st of December 2012 is when the calendar runs out. Now, of course, anything running out and anything that um, is predicted by an ancient civilization brings a lot of magic or mysticism and doomsday, as it turns out. And then, so after a few articles at the University Today, it quickly became apparent that Hollywood were going to do a movie, a disaster movie based on 2012. And so if you didn't already know about this 2012 Mayan prophecy, it isn't actually a prophecy, it's just their calendar running out, um, you knew about it because it was a massive viral campaign. And to be honest, I was very um, uh, critical of the way that was handled because it deliberately incited fear. And that was basically what these doomsayers were doing. These guys with YouTube accounts with books to sell, very small time. They, they've just got a book they, they have, you know, random interest, throwing a lot of mysticism, throwing a lot of archaeology, confuse the science, wrap it all up, and then you've got doomsday. Um, at, at the time when I first started writing about it, that wasn't really a massive problem. It wasn't mainstream. But when Hollywood grabbed hold of it, they thought it was a great storyline. So um, they decided to profit on people's fear. I mean, you had these guys in their back rooms writing books on the subject, and you had multi, multi-million dollar blockbuster movies making money out of it. So suddenly it became mainstream. Um, and then Once it was a really crappy movie. <laughs> well, uh, hey, the, the CGI was great, but well, that was it. And uh, you know, I don't want to see California slip into the ocean. But unfortunately, people got scared, and you can't really criticize a movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. The neutrinos basically turned the interior of the Earth into into jello, and the whole thing exploded. And again, every single doomsday theory that's been knocking around up until that point were thrown into this movie. Um, in fact, they didn't overemphasize the Mayan calendar, which I thought was a, was, a, was a strange move, but still, it was all attributed to the Mayan calendar running out. And now, since then, it's just been a pitch battle, and I think today, I just read in the comments, Fraser, you were, were 
replying to a commenter saying that no, it's the science media should be debunking this stuff, and it's useful because otherwise these crazy doomsday theorists and Hollywood movies will think that they can get away with misinterpreting science at its most basic level. I mean, at its most evil level, they are deliberately messing with science to say that there's planet X just about to hit into Earth. There is no scientific evidence for any of these theories. The Mayans didn't predict it, and in fact, the, the end of that calendar is actually a big spiritual time. And as it turns out, and I always say it's bad to the prophet on doomsday, but the tourism board in Guatemala is expecting an extra few million people turning up this year to, to actually spend the event in the Mayan, where the old Mayan te temples are now. Um, and I find that amazing. That's great. So yeah, that's, that's fine for them to profit off, off of people's you know excitement about the whole thing. But, uh, I, but basically, I think it's the, the whole conclusion. I think from this whole debunking exercise is it's a very negative process. So I think it's up to the science media to turn it into a positive one. And so we need to latch on to these uh, doomsday theories, no matter how stupid they appear, because there's a lot of people who aren't scientifically literate. I mean, we're very lucky. We, 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 we live in a very uh, science-savvy audience, because they come to our websites and you know, visit our universities and you know, interact with us on a, on a science level. But there's a lot of people out there that actually pay attention to um, Fox News um, and amongst other outlets. And they actually believe that that is um, that's the case. So it's up to the science media to say, look, this is this is this is bull crap, and this is the real science behind it. And actually, the real science is way more fascinating than doomsday. And I think that's a big responsibility. But I think everybody is kind of united in that idea. Yeah, and I think I'm not going to. You know, we're definitely not even going to bother debunking it. Like it's it's all ridiculous. Yeah. But I think you know. But I think the the, converse, the deeper conversation, and this is sort of what I got got caught into this discussion thread back on Universe Today, was just there's a there's a large group of people out there who think that it's not worth even bringing it up. That even bringing up these kinds of ridiculous theories <coughs> is is not even worth talking about. The, but the problem with the internet is that this information just moves at light speed from person to person, and and if you don't have a counter meme out there that's debunking it. As quickly at, at, as you know, at the same speed, then you're just you're just not going to make an impact on people, and I and it, and so then you're just kind of your silence implies consent, and I think that's one of the things that that we do. I mean, I know with Phil, you've been this has sort of been the the drum you've been beating since '98 when you first started to do your your Apollo moon landing hoax conversations, right? Maybe even earlier than that. The, the moon hoax really reared its head after Fox TV aired a show <coughs> in 2001. But it, in fact, uh, a lot of this 2012 stuff is just the, the same warmed over noisome nastiness from uh, 10 years ago from Nibiru and Planet X. Uh, which was supposed to destroy the Earth in 2003, and I don't know if you know anybody listening even remembers that. If you go to my website and search Planet X, you'll find it. But even you know, there were a lot of people scared then that that there was something that was going to happen to wipe out life on Earth. But that was based on junk from earlier by a guy named Sitchin who had written all these books about a 12th planet that was going to destroy the Earth. And that was recycled crap from the 1950s written by Velikovsky. And, and that was very popular uh, in colleges and the, in counterculture that, that uh, the, the Bible was literally true and there were planets moving around that caused all these biblical disasters. So this stuff is, is not new and not correct. And I, you know, I'll be writing about this very soon. I, I, Fraser, you're right. Uh, I, you know, I have not been writing about it because every time I sit down to write about it, I just go, <laughs> and, and, and it's so hard to write about some of this stuff. And you have to decide at what point am I going to jump in? You know, there have been there have been so many of these these conspiracy theories over time, and I'll watch them. Somebody will send me an email. Have you seen this guy who says comets are actually dragons that eat the sun? And I'm like, no, I don't care. That's going to die, and nobody cares. Um, on the other hand, uh, there was this article that came out that said that the, the star Betelgeuse is going to explode in 2012 and, and, and confirm the Mayan prophecy. And this was written on a conspiracy theory website. And I saw it, and I went, mm, this is, uh, I don't know if I want to write about this. And then it got 
put on Twitter by somebody who has a lot of followers. So I had to jump in and go, no, 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 and ah, type really quickly and get this out and, and got it up on the web and got it out on Twitter and everything and, and was able to debunk this. So you have to decide, when am I going to go in there? Is this thing going to die a natural death and nobody's going to hear about it? Or is this going to hit critical mass and explode? 2012 did this a long time ago, but it, it, again, it is re it's mostly recycled stuff from previously failed doomsdays. And I'm going to start writing about this soon, and that's, I think that's a point I'm going to hammer home pretty hard. I think once people realize, oh, this is like the fifth time this has been said, maybe, maybe there's not a whole lot of credence to it. And I think each, each year we hope that the message will get through and be remembered, and then we're done having to debunk all this stuff ever again. But, I, but one of the ones that we've been dealing with is the Mars, moon, Mars as big as yeah. the moon argument that keeps coming into everyone's email boxes every August, which, is this, which was this myth that went around that, you know, and I think it was like some poorly edited email, and you've probably all heard it now. It was a PowerPoint. Like the the PowerPoint, PowerPoint slides. Yeah. yeah. Someone, someone had said that... Bad that, ones. Yeah, that, <laughs> that if you, you know, in August, um, you know, it was the... In, sorry, August 2003 was the closest approach of Mars in something like 50,000 years. And that was true, you know, that was real science. And that then Mars was going to be bright and very visible and this wonderful red object on the, you know, in the sky. Also and that's all, also true. And, and that if you looked through an 80 power telescope at Mars, mm -hmm. it would look the same to your eye in the telescope as it would, you know, as the moon would look in the sky. And somehow that got edited, and the date, the year got somehow pulled out, and then this thing just went around the internet mm -hmm. that Mars would look as big as the sky. And so and every August, this email makes the rounds again, and we debunk it all afresh. But these are all teachable moments. I mean, mm -hmm. the awesome thing about this is this is an opportunity to talk about um, the vast distances, vast distances of space and that the difference between Mars being closest to Earth and furthest from Earth when they're both in a line with the sun, um, on the same side of the sun, is the same as me and St. Louis hopping back and forth in the change in distance between me and London. So it's not a huge change, and we can start talking about these things. And with the 2012 fiasco, this is a teachable moment to point out, hey, you with your driveway telescope can go out and prove this wrong by looking for meteors and comets in the sky. You could see this if this was truly something where we had to worry about a planet plunging towards us. You can see Jupiter. You can see Saturn. Right now, if something was going to hit us in December, it would be visible. And the fact that you don't see these things, that's your way of exploring the universe and debunking for yourself the insanity of the Internet, giving people the tools to learn astronomy and to see the facts-based universe versus the made-up-by-not-looking-outside universe. We're here to use these moments to give people the ability to understand the universe for themselves. They also make good questions for an astronomy qualifying exam. <laughs> to make somebody sit there and calculate what the brightness of Nibiru would be, and or, yeah, you know, how big so the Mars is. a young woman who's about to, to get her PhD. <laughs> yes, I, I passed my quals. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess you would have taken them a couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if the uh, flap over the Harold Camping rapture uh, fiasco uh. has uh, been kind of a vaccination against. Uh, too much 2012 hype because that was uh, hyped so much, especially in May, uh, that uh, folks, I hope that some folks have realized that just because somebody says something is going to happen and uh, it gets picked up by God knows who, uh, that doesn't mean it's absolutely going to happen. And, and so it, it seems to me that that the 2012 fever may have cooled down a little bit, and maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part. Yeah, uh, it, it, the, weird, the, the weird thing was um, that I went to my spinning class um, literally two days ago, and, you know, spinning and science don't really, you know, they're completely, completely different. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. But, but you know, the people that I I I I, sp I spin with are completely separate from the science crowd that I, I spend time with. So it was um it was weird when I went in and it was after the lesson and the spinning instructor came over to me and we, we just started chatting about random stuff and he goes, Oh yeah, how was your new year? And I saw it was great. He goes, Oh, we got a, a really big year this year and I said well, yeah, I suppose so. You've got the London Olympics, you've got the you know, presidential elections. He goes, Yeah, and, and that Mayan thing, that's interesting. And I went, 
really what the whole doomsday thing yeah he goes I don't really believe it but it's interesting how you know so many so many things are going to happen on that day and of course I said oh that's why I'm in my backyard so I told him about it came a card and he's going to you know read about it but that that was a shock to me because I've never I mean I've I've spoken about it with people in the science community obviously that yeah. that, that is very well known but now I'm seeing it more and more popping up on Facebook, especially. I'm seeing a lot of friends who perhaps aren't that, you know, they, they have a passing interest into what, what's on my feed, but they obviously don't pay attention to the debunking articles because they're saying, oh, you know, enjoy every month while we've still got it because, you know, and on the 21st of December, we're all going to die. And it's this fear. And, it, and the thing is that that's not joking. I mean, you, you often get people are, you know, taking the piss, but you also get the guys who are, genuinely worried about this stuff and they've taken it as a matter of fact and that is exactly where we step in and we don't want to make it a matter of fact because there is no fact behind it it's just pure lies stories and it's just um, it's almost like folklore that's just gone gone haywire across the internet and it seems that you know bad news travels fast but doomsday news travels faster I mean people just seem to know about it and it's become common knowledge which is Bizarre, because I think with the whole um, uh, the, the, the whole uh, May Doomsday, that was based on a religious apocalypse, and you either buy into the religious side or you don't. And I think it's very easy for people to say, "Well, that's just religious nuts going crazy," because that's the, they they can box that up, put it in a pigeonhole, and say, "Look, that's what's going to happen." Whereas the Mayan Doomsday, there seems to be it's based on an ancient culture that really did exist, and yeah, their calendar is coming to an end. And it's open to interpretation what that means. And I think these doomsayers have really jumped on this one day and they've thrown everything at it in a massive hope to sell more books. And that's what it comes down to. They are trying to gain popularity. They are trying to sell their websites, trying to sell their books. And that's what it comes down to, just selling, uh, selling out for people's fear. And I just think that's an incredible achievement by them, I'll tell you. But, I mean, like you said, there's something we can do. You yeah. know, I yeah. mean, everyone watching this video is probably like, you know, that astronomy person in their group of friends. And, you know, your friends are going to come to you and ask you, so what's the deal with this Mayan mm -hmm. thing or the planets aligning? And you can be that one that says, yeah, yeah don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, up in the news. Yeah. It, it's a chance. Too. It's a chance to actually learn about the Mayans. This, this mm -hmm. is a culture Fantastic. that was one of the most amazing cultures on the planet from 250 to 900 AD. They had immense cities. They had one of the earliest writing systems. Their calendar system was frightening, frighteningly complex in their attempt to be able to accurately keep track of dates. And as, as Fraser and I discussed in a recent astronomy cast, calendars are a bear to create because there isn't an integer number of days in a year. There isn't an integer number of lunar cycles in a year, so it gets hard to create a calendar. But the thing is, while the Mayan civilization is no longer the um, world-leading civilization that it was at 250 AD, it still exists, and you don't see Mayans panicking about this. Mm -hmm. So this is an opportunity for us to learn about this civilization, go visit it. I know Fraser and I are going to actually spend December 21st at um, ruins in Mexico at Tulum. Um, learn about this culture. If you're going to spend money on the doomsday, spend money on actual astronomy books. Spend money on actual archaeology books. Use this to learn about the truth behind all of it and to support science writers, archaeology writers, and tourism in these countries that desperately need the tourism. Yeah, if, if people haven't heard about that, Pamela and I are going to be participating in a cruise with uh, David Brin and a bunch of other, other some astronauts and stuff wow. to to uh, cruise around and celebrate the not end of the world. And Details are at astrosphere.org, yeah. so you can yeah. find out how to join us at astrosphere.org. Yeah. And and I've been to Tulum. Year, uh, it's actually Penn really nice. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. This year, the Penn Museum is going to have a big uh, exhibit on Maya culture and astronomy, uh, and they've got their 30th annual uh, Maya weekend on May 4th. And so uh, if you can go to the Maya ruins, that's great. If you can't get there, you might want to go to Philadelphia and check out the Penn Museum. That's, and that's good. And that's a good example of that you know, teachable moment. Um, so I know we're kind of running out of time a bit. There, was, there, was actually, there actually was one piece of science that, that needs to be injected back in, which is the discovery of some more planets. Ian, you wanted to talk about that, right? About some of the new planets from 
Oh yeah, um, yeah. There was a kind of a surprise yesterday. If if you don't have the Exoplanet app on your iPhone, get it because it's brilliant. It gets me all my Exoplanet breaking news. But um, yeah, it just popped up on there randomly, um, saying four new planets to be discovered. And I was looking through online, and I couldn't really find anything about it. But it's actually a um, I forget the name of the project, but it's actually the uh, it's a Harvard-funded uh, project. Is it the, the HAT, the Hat, Hat, Hat Net. yeah, Hat Net, yeah, Hat Net. Thank you. Um, and yeah, they administer these six cameras that look at a wide swathe of the night sky, and they try basically the same thing what Kepler does, the Kepler Space Telescope. It basically watches for these exoplanets that drift in front of their parent star, and therefore you get a slight dip in brightness. And so they confirm the discovery of four hot Jupiters, they're called, basically large gas giant planets. Um, forget about life or any idea that these are anything Earth-like. They are more a very, very hellish Jupiter that orbits very, very close to that star. And um, so the first four, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like a business as usual um, publication because I had to have a look at the the paper to actually get a press. There was no press release, so there was no big announcement. But it was notable for the fact that it's the first four discoveries of the year, and I think this year is going to be a massive year for yeah. exoplanetary studies because we are approaching the three well the yeah, the three and a half year mark where Kepler um, has to confirm a, a genuine Earth sized planet orbiting in its habitable zone around a sun like star. I wouldn't call it Earth-like yet, because we haven't got a clue what the atmosphere is. Kepler can't see the atmospheres of these distant worlds, but we may be able to start to have an idea as to how many Earth-sized planets there are out there. And we've already had, it before the end of the year, we had a massive, um, the gates opened with exoplanetary discoveries. We had Earth-sized planets, we had planets orbiting habitable zones, um, and we had multi-planetary star systems, like the solar system. And it's just incredibly exciting. I mean, if this is one field that really gets my writing juices going is definitely exoplanetary stuff because it's well cool. So um, yeah, so keep an eye on exoplanetary studies this year. But as I say, the first four have been discovered of the year, so exciting uh, stuff. And I think the last topic that I that I teased people with at the beginning was to talk about Obama teleporting to Mars. <laughs> so, hey, <laughs> Nancy, uh, I, I believe you're the person who knows most about this because we posted an article on Universe today about it, but. Uh, and then I got into yeah. an argument with the readers about whether or not we should be posting this kind of nonsense. So, yeah, yeah I, I don't think, I don't know if this is just a uh, a, a birther thing gone gone completely crazy. But anyway, a uh, a lawyer from Washington State, which somehow being a lawyer must give him some credibility, uh, he and another person claimed that they were part of a time travel pro program back in the 1970s that was uh, instituted by DARPA. Of course, that really gives a lot of uh, uh, interest to it as well. It was the code name of the project was Project Pegasus. And they claim that, uh, that they and Obama were part of a, a group of young adults that were chosen to travel to Mars via teleportation uh, in a, uh, a top secret project that would kind of um, you know, acclimate Mars to uh, human presence, I think was what, what what the uh, claim of the uh, project the life was. on Mars to human presence. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I I don't know. It just seems just a tad bit extreme to me. But you know. just a tad. There's nothing there that trips my alarm bells. This all sounds, you know, after <laughs> after the birther movement and the 9/11 movement and the the you know, it's like it, the simultaneous. You know, Obama's affiliated with a with a weird church and a mosque at the same time. These two arguments were going on. This is clearly no more out there than anything else I've heard. But you know, wouldn't you want someone who is a teenager with such an amazing science student that he was selected for a top secret teenage trip to Mars? Isn't that someone who's sufficiently qualified to be president of the United States? No, he's an elite then. <laughs> no, then he's. <laughs> Um, if maybe my political persuasion is coming out here a little bit. but <laughs> we, we need a sarcasm warning because you can just imagine yeah. the crazies pulling this out and yeah. quoting yeah. us yeah. online. Okay, yeah. Not yeah. think out this actually context. happened. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Not stuff, think this actually happened. What kills um, me about these things too is, is you know, these come out. And it's, it's like 2012. These seem to come out of nowhere and, and this will disappear. You know? and, and the only reason any of us has heard about it is because it's funny. 
You know, yeah. this one. This one's pretty silly. Teleportation and time travel and going to Mars and, woo, and Obama's involved. If Obama weren't involved, this wouldn't have any any teeth at all in the media. But you know, it'll go away. But there'll be something coming along next week that'll take its place. Um, oh, yeah. I think the other thing that made it big was the CIA actually had to come out and officially deny it. Yeah, and, and the White House did as well, that they yeah. said that no, Obama has not been to Mars. That's all I need. If you get on these UFO mailing lists, uh, you'll find a conspiracy a week. You know, I think uh, there was something about how the Zeta Reticuli uh, forces negotiated a peace between the Greys and the Reptilians a couple of months Finally. ago. Finally! And uh, I don't know if you've heard about that. But that, that was, was probably done here at the Denver this. airport oh, because oh, that's oh, where the reptilians are based that's underground. Right. It's, I mean, th and, and if you think I'm kidding, <laughs> go look up, go look up Denver talking. airport reptilian on Google and see yeah. what you see. The, the levels of, con of necessary people being part of this conspiracy for this to be true, though, are just mind-blowing. Mind because if... Obama were going to Mars to acclimate critters, life forms on Mars to the presence of humans. It means all of the data from every lander that's ever gone to Mars would have had to have been faked because we've never seen anything that would require acclimation to the human presence. It would require conspiracies in terms of his classmates when he was a student would have had to not know about it. It would require conspiracies in terms of every mission all of DARPA, all of his high school students, all of his family. Really, could you come up, could you come up with anything that required more people to be lied to and keep things secret and more data to have been faked? It, it's really kind of phenomenal. You're in the pocket of Big Mars. We can't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I it's Mars. in Mars, I believe. Yeah. Big space. <laughs> uh, and so now you know what it sounds like to be uh, hanging out with a group of uh, a group of, of science journalists. Um, so uh, my phone my phone is ringing in the background, so I'll just let it ring. Um, uh, but uh, wanted to take a second as well and give people a chance if they wanted to ask our panel of uh, of experts uh, some questions. You can post those questions into the thread below, and I'll sort of troll through it and um, and pose some of the questions to the to the team if anyone's got anything. But then the other thing is um, somebody asked, oh I forget where, someone asked if if we can post how many numbers of how many people watched it and the reality is we can't. We actually have no idea how many people are watching this right now. It could be zero. Um, so so what you want to do to to give us a sense is to plus one this video. And so if you go back up to the you know right below where the video is, there's a plus one, there's a share, and there's comments. If you can plus one it, that will give us a rough idea. If if every person who's watching it, you can only plus one at once. If everyone who's watching this plus ones it, then we'll know approximately how many people are are watching it. Uh, and then I will take a look down sort of at the bottom of the comments now and see if anybody has any any questions for us or or hilarious uh, additions. Um, uh, Steve Rushton said, says that uh, he loved the DARPA Obama story and proof that a, that a conspiracy theorist, anything is possible. And I think that's, that's it. When I first heard of the story, I was just like, come on, really? But, but the fact is, as, as Alan says, you, know, you follow some of these lists and you will see the kinds of conspiracy theories that are going on. Just as I don't kind like of anecdote word, on that. Oh. Um, uh, okay. The first experience I had with the whole uh, Young Earth Creationist was actually from t a Terry Pratchett book where he was just making fun of it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no one believes that. And it was only three years later that I first discovered there's a large contingent of people that do. I've been, um, I've been doing this for, for 10, 12 years now or more. And, I, and I, you know, I don't like to use the word crazy because there's a, whole, there's a lot of baggage with that word. But... In, in, in terms of this, there is no idea so crazy that you cannot find somebody to believe it. There, you, know, you can make up the, the most ridiculous stuff you can, and you will find a contingency that follows it. Uh, you know, there's a theory out there that comets are hot and are growing in mass as they go around the sun, when in fact they are very cold and losing mass. I mean, this is exactly, precisely the opposite of reality, and I still get emails about this, even though this, I've debunked this 10 years ago. This stuff will be coming back. It always comes back. And, and, and I want to add something really quickly here. Um, I gave a talk last year to some students, uh, middle school students, and I said, you know, hey, do you have any questions? And somebody said, what's all, what's all this here? I'm hearing about 2012. 
So I said, oh, it's nonsense, and it's based on the wrong idea of the calendar, and here's all the science behind what these guys are claiming and why it's wrong. The teacher apologized to me afterwards. He was embarrassed. I mean, like, red-faced embarrassed, saying, I am so sorry my students asked you about something that dumb. And I said, dude, don't apologize. Your students are asking about it because they're hearing about it. They're using the web, and they don't know that this is coming from bad sources. You have to be open to this stuff and talk to them about it because that's what they're talking about. And I want to add one thing to that is that that is that the kids don't know any better. They don't know about planets. They don't know about the scale of the solar system. They don't know about the mind calendars or the supermassive black hole or the solar flares. They're just hearing about this stuff, and it's, it's rising up in their consciousness without any real basis of evidence or fact. The people, I think it was Nicole and Pamela, you guys said, look, the people listening to us right now, these are the folks who are the astronomer in their social groups. The two things I want you to do is that when somebody asks you about it, point them to the right sources, of course, but also be patient, okay? There are people out there promoting 2012, as, as Ian said, to sell their books, to sell their videos. These people may believe in it, or they may be moralist, loathsome scum, say. Uh, but whatever, they're out there promoting it, and you can be angry at them, but the people who are listening to it, don't be angry at them, okay? Be, be sympathetic and say, yeah, you know what, I know, I've seen that stuff too. Here's what's really going on. Be patient, be calm, be open, engage with them, and that's how you're going to turn them to our side, the side of truth and reality, and then they will go out and talk about that as well. And, and this is particularly true with the kids. We, we've had an elementary school kid commenting on a story on 2012 on 365 Days of Astronomy podcast. And this kid is earnestly terrified. And we're working to go through, talk to them through email to try and get them to understand they really don't need to be afraid. But when you're a kid and you hear on the radio, when you hear on television, you hear on all of the authoritative sources you know about that the world's ending. You get scared. So be honest and use this to teach. And be careful. Now, I know Nancy had to, had to go. She's actually going on a road trip. But um, how's everyone's time? Because I've got a few questions that are coming. Can people, can people, people spare about 15 minutes or so? Is yeah. that OK? Yeah. 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 If you, can, you know, feel free, to, feel free to leave if you need to. Um, you know. Yeah, I have to take off. But thanks so much for having me, Fraser, And uh, really enjoyed it. Looks it's great. Doing it again. Open invites there, Alan. So great to see you. And, and thanks for all your help. All right, so let me see. So let me, let me just sort of queue up a couple of questions here for people. Um, uh, all right, so Daniel Berenger asked, uh, given China's recent advances in regards to space exploration, what happened with China wanting to join the ISS and what could have been done differently? Uh, this is called ITAR. Um, that, uh, this is one of those problems where, like when you buy, I think it's Xboxes, it says, thou shalt not take it to China, somewhere in the details of all the things you agree to. We have regulations in the United States on what countries our technology is allowed to be shared with, and China is absolutely off that list. Currently, there's actually a congressional mandate that people are not allowed to visit NASA, uh, and not allowed to visit China on NASA funds, which means that there is a very good astronomy conference in Beijing this October, and no one from NASA was allowed to attend the conference. Because of all of these restrictions, because the International Space Station is largely a U.S.-Russian endeavor, China can't be a part of it. Now, this summer, as part of the International Space uh, University, I was able to listen to a fabulous lecture from one of the leaders in Chinese space science, and they were outlining their plans for the future, and we're toast. They have amazing plans. They have an amazing industrial complex. They have an amazing educational system that is stressing STEM and is also starting to stress creativity. And as they ramp up this system, and as they output more and more scientifically literate populations, um, having one of the largest populations on the planet, they're going to be able to innovate in ways that we can't imagine right now. Um, they're the future for space exploration, and commercial space flight in America is the future for space exploration. Things are changing. It's going to be an interesting future. And I'm hoping that this will lead to competition that kicks our butt into doing amazing things. Well, I'm Canadian, so you know. 
I'll just cheer from the sidelines. Hey, you guys directions. build great arms. You, you guys make robot yeah. arms. We love there you them. Go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to say, I want to agree with Pamela. <clears throat> Up to a point, and this is something I want, I want folks to understand too, I don't want us to get involved in another space race like we did in the 60s with the Soviet Union, America versus yeah. the Soviet Union to get to the moon, because what happened then was that when you have a race, once you get to the end, once you've reached your goal, you're done. And really people say, why, did, why didn't we ever go back to the moon? Why didn't we keep going? I said, because we did what we set out to do. We beat the Soviet Union. Yeah. And if you want to summarize the entire motivation for the Apollo missions, it was to beat the Soviet Union. Yeah. So in this case, uh, I like the idea of uh, a Chinese uh, space agency motivating us to, to, to go back out there. I don't want it to turn into the same sort of thing that happened 40 years ago, because then 15 years from now, the moon is still just going to be a rock with nobody on it. And I'd like to see colonies yeah. back on there, now, or, or, uh, the, on there for the first time. The thing where I really would like to see it to become a race is to see who can educate their population the best. So if, if we can start getting competitive, where during the Apollo era, amazing amounts of money were sunk into getting people into science programs, getting people into, into science camps, getting people educated in technology and math. If we can do that, that alone would produce a population that would carry the dream forward. Unfortunately, the people who had that education in the past are now retiring. So we need to get that educated population back. Um, Mark Wirtz wanted to know, um, he'd love to hear our expectations for the August landing of the Curiosity Mars rover. So, I mean, needless to say, we'll be reporting on that in every way possible. And definitely, as, the, uh, as Curiosity is approaching Mars, we'll, we'll talk about it a lot more. Um, Somebody, this got buried in the stream too, uh, somebody was asking about what uh, app Ian was talking about, and it's the Exoplanet app. As he was talking, I muted my microphone, opened iTunes, and downloaded it. Um, so, so this is live, folks. So if you go to iTunes and type in Exoplanet into the iTunes store, uh, it's a free app. I downloaded it. It's on my phone now. I'll hook up my iPad later. But um, I, had, I played with it before I had an iPad and iPhone. I, I went online and looked at what it had, and I thought, gosh, I wish I had that, those, those mobile things so I could do that. Now I do, so I've got them. And check out the 3D um, visualization one. If you click 3D, you can actually see the Milky Way and flip it around and see where these um, exoplanets are in relation to Earth. Ooh. Cool. That's and cool. it's amazing where oh. they aren't. It starts to give you a hint of where they're looking. Yeah. 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 Um, so Dan Gershevich asks, uh, what are some of the impacts that you see coming from NASA open sourcing their stuff? Has anyone been following this? Um, so, so there's a number of different things going on. First of all, all NASA data is in the public domain. That's always been true. It's never changed. That doesn't mean it's easy to use. So like the planetary data system, you can get all of the NASA images, and you will hate yourself in the process of figuring out how to make them pretty. Uh, go to unmanned spaceflight to learn how to do that. Um, other things are uh, different software projects. The NASA Top Coder program is working to engage people in solving scientific problems by relying on the population of coders that are out there. Uh, bit by bit, parts of NASA are going out. Um, I think I'm probably missing a link to, in my head to the specific project this person is talking about. But what I see working with NASA is this constant movement to open up what they're doing, to reach out to commercial companies, to reach out to individual programmers, and make space part of more people's lives and distribute the work, distribute the funding. Um, this is where you start seeing NASA hiring SpaceX to design rockets for the future. That is I really think cool. the other kind of important thing going on there is there's always been a lot of discussion about how many just kind of facts uh, science generates nowadays. It's yeah. kind of like a collection of a brickyard, but we seem to sometimes be so obsessed with collecting bricks that we stop building buildings. And I think being able to hand out the bricks to more people this way is another potential way we might get more buildings, more theories, more discoveries that otherwise may have just kind of sat undiscovered in that brickyard. Well, I think there's a good analogy with what we're doing even with this Google Hangout, right? Google created this technology of the Hangouts. They then bolted on the ability to publicize the Hangout. 
on air, but had no expectations of what it was going to be used for. And so for people who were tuning in to us yesterday, we live streamed a telescope into a hangout and we're broadcasting views of the moon and Jupiter right into the hangout and and Phil and Pamela were were giving their overview of the of the science and sort of looking at the craters and we're talking about the map so I mean it's the same kind of thing which is that if you you have no idea what your technology is going to be used for what your software is going to be used for and at every point it is always better to open it up to make it more widely available to get more people involved to just have more brainstorming more ideas and and then you know you let a thousand flowers bloom, and this is the kind of uh, um, the kinds of things that's always good for NASA, and this is the kind of feedback that a lot of us will be giving them all the time. But just open it up, get more people involved. And and one of the things that, that's kind of amazing is they're opening up the discovery process as well. One of the things that Fraser, Phil, and Nicole, once she's done with her PhD, and I are working on is a suite of NASA-funded citizen science projects that will be launching soon. They're not fully launched yet, but you can go to the site, cosmoquest.org, and learn about what's coming. And this project is um, taking data from DAWN, from MESSENGER, from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, from the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, search data being used by the New Horizons mission. And all of this data goes into your computer screens and you help do tasks that normally we would ask graduate students and undergrads to do and by helping us complete these tasks you become part of the scientific process and many of the people that have gotten en engaged in things like this in the past have moved forward to working on their own science going on to get degrees and becoming scientists in their own right who are making major discoveries about the universe we live in so I, I added one new participant to the Hangout, um, and he'll be, he'll be here for the last couple of minutes. And that's Jay Cross, who is the uh, one of the administrators for the uh, Bad Astronomy Universe Today forum that, that Phil and I co-administrate and, and uh, with Jay and and a couple other people. And Jay posted a question into the comment thread, but I thought I would just sort of summon him and, and have him hit us with the question directly and possibly even the answer. And Jay posted a question into the comment. I think we're getting an echo from you, Jay. So, so yeah, Jay's. I've, hold on. Yeah. So Jay's question was for us to talk about the cosmic neutrino detector. Does anyone have a? I don't know if you want to sort of crack your question there, Jay. Oh, we lost him. So, does anyone know anything about the cosmic neutrino detector? No, no actually. No, I know about some various uh, neutrino. Uh, projects that are out there. I know about the uh, uh, the one in Antarctica, I believe it is, the South Pole experiment. Is that okay. ICE or Amanda? Oh. Which one? Ice. Late. Late. Um, so I, I lost you guys for just a moment, but let me go into a little more detail about what I'm asking about. Um, the uh, There are a lot of things that have been coming into the news recently, so there was not just Ice Cube which is the cubic kilometer, and not just Antares, which is the you know, roughly kilometer-sized thing, the bottom of the Mediterranean, but now there's the new, uh, I can't remember, it's KM3 something or other, a uh, five-kilometer uh, thing they're talking about building in the Mediterranean, and there's the thing the Russians are building in the bottom of Lake Bacal, and uh, you know, possibly another one that, that I read. It seemed like they were, were going from about one cubic kilometer at Ice Cube now to uh, five or six years from now, probably having more like uh, 10 to 15 cubic kilometers of space. But what they're looking for is not, you know, the cool solar neutrinos that, that we're finding, uh, you know, in Japan and that uh, uh, Sudbury thing, but rather the super high energy neutrinos that are from cosmic sources, which, as far as I can tell, so far we really have never seen one where we knew where it came from. And that there's the one exception to that. Yeah. The, the one exception where we know where it came from? Yes, yeah, Supernova uh, 1987A. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. That, that's, that, there was no cosmic neutrino detected at, at ultra high speeds coming from that. Ah. Okay, you're talking about right. the Not really a, yeah. high energy ones. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no. We've we've seen lots of neutrinos where we know where they came from. They, from the sun, most of them come from the sun. And and yes, in 1987 we saw 19 or 22 neutrinos that that uh, you know hit our big tanks of water. But um, Ice Cube, 
doesn't look for solar neutrinos, apparently. It looks for much, much higher energy neutrinos. Oh, right, another, another one was um, they're talking about expanding Ice Cube by listening for uh, 10 kilohertz sound waves from neutrinos hitting the ice also, and, and that they might be able to get maybe 100 cubic kilometers uh, by, by doing that. Well, so I mean, we've had a couple of articles on the universe today, and some of these, these proposed constructions are, are like some of the largest con, you know, things ever built in the world. I mean, the, yeah, uh, I, the I think that's nonsense, right? That, that <laughs> underwater because, floating, but yeah, no, I understand. I, but you there's, know, there's strings of, of little bubbles, and, and uh, they're, they're saying, oh, the second largest thing in the world compared only by the Great Wall of China, and it's like, you know, the Great Wall of China <laughs> is small compared to the U.S. highway system, right? <laughs> Uh, but can you call it an edifice? Uh, you know, none of them are, are, are I, they, they are colossal in terms of how big they are, but uh, uh, they're cheap to build compared to uh, something else that, that is millions of cubic kilometers or something like that. So, so right. just to explain what, what happens with these things, when you have neutrinos, high energy ones with the correct energy, um, collide with ice, water ice, which Antarctica is rich in, um, there is the possibility that this collision will emit particles called leptons, which we don't detect. But the leptons decay very quickly, and this decay process causes a flash of light. This is Shrenkov radi radiation. And to detect this, they embed in the ice long chains of detectors. This is where the idea that these are the biggest things in the world come from, because you have giant ice and lots of strings of yeah, yeah, sensors yeah. going through the ice. So the reason that they have to be so big is neutrinos do not like to interact. They're very antisocial particles, or scientifically put, they have a very low cross-section of interaction. So the probability of interactions is very low. So in order to try and guarantee that you're going to get a detectable signal, you have to have vast numbers of sensors looking at vast numbers of molecules of ice that just maybe, maybe, maybe a few of these will undergo interactions. So what we're hoping is by building all of these different detectors all across the world, we'll slowly build up sufficient signal that we can start saying, OK, we now understand what these suckers are doing. We now understand the probabilities of interaction. Now we can build a theory to try and understand the sources, the causes, and all of these other things. Neutrinos are one of those things we know exist. But beyond that, we just don't know that much. So we're trying to understand by trying to detect them more and more. Well, I think I'm going to have to wrap it up at this point because I know everyone uh, has been here for quite a while. Um, so thanks to everybody who, who joined us. And again, if you're watching this, can you please plus one it so we can just get a sense of, of how many people. I think right now we're at 188. So I think we've, we've got about 200 people watching, probably more. Um, but that'll help give Google some numbers as well. And, and, and again, let us know if this is the kind of thing you want us to do on a regular basis. Although at this point, I think we won't stop. <laughs> it's about it's us, fun. not you. Can't it's stop the signal. Um, and it's and it's easy. I mean, I think this is you know I've been saying this again and again that that, that I know that video is pretty tough to do. <laughs> Nicole's friends, um, her party. Uh, just this is very easy for us to do, and I think because it's not a, you know because we can just invite everybody and we can just start the hangout and we can record the video and put it somewhere else. That you know it's it's. Because it's not a lot of work for us, it's something we can do on a regular basis, which I think is the which is the key. So, um, so again, thank you to all of the uh, the people who joined us. Thanks to everyone who contributed. Thanks to all our panelists, and we'll see you again uh, this time uh, a week from now. With oh, a lot of news from the AAS meeting. That's right. That's yes. going to be a big a big thing for news. So It'll be a big week. All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody, and thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you later. Bye everyone. Bye.